Um, all right, there we go. So we're recording now and we may get started in just a moment. Um, just to let you know, if you uh, are wanting not to participate, you don't want your face to be shown, you're welcome to hide. Um, and when we get started after we have some uh, breakout rooms and things like that, uh, we'll try to keep make sure we'll make sure in the recording that if we have any back and forth where it, we need to uh, keep people's comments out of the recording, we'll do that. But I think the main thing tonight is uh, for us to give uh, Reverend Dr. Cheryl Lindsay the chance to share with us her wisdom and experience. Uh, and so I'm really excited to have Cheryl here with us. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Anti-Racism Network. Um, and uh, so we're going to get started now. And uh, see, some people are still coming in. Uh, but we are going to start tonight with uh, just a quick, uh, I can find where the button is. So quick reading of our vision and mission statement and Kay is here, and Kay's, Kay's joining us with her phone, uh, but I'm going to put this on the screen, and then Kay, are you still able to read for us? All right. Give her just a second and see. And Kay, are you, are you able to join us? All right. Well, I've got the slide. I'm with ready. Me. Oh, you're ready. All right, good. So let me share my screen here. And uh, so here you see all the leader Kay is going to read and then we're going to follow with uh, the group. Okay. Following Jesus's call. Following Jesus call. Oh. To extravagantly love all God's children and creation. To extravagantly love vision and anti-racist world. Therefore, we we are that that engages, encourages, equips, and empowers the work of anti-racism in every arena and in life. All right. Thank you for that, Kay. Um, and got a centering prayer moment now from uh, Emily. Hi, everyone. My name is Pastor Emily Howard. I'm dialing in from Worcester. Um, it's my joy to share just a brief devotional for us as we prepare our hearts. Um, we, together as the leadership team, came up with some ideas, and out of that was born um, these images and words. So I invite you to settle your heart um, and invite as well um, our remembrance that God's presence is reflected in each and every person that is here. The prayer um, words tonight are written by Reverend David Long Higgins, who can't be with us, and they are based on this scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And in the slides to come, you'll see a lot of images of holy, holy things. Um, these are icons. So as you pray through these, please engage the image as your spirit moves you to. I'll try to read slowly so you can enjoy them. Loving God, form my life as a mirror, reflecting something of you into the world today. Free me from myself, getting out of the way of ego's insistent design Instead, consenting to you in loving submission, persistently opening a new way in me. Grant me the joy of turning away from wrong in thought, word, and deed, and toward the truth of your persistent love, bearing healing and hope in perpetual rejoicing at all you make possible. Bear me up for this, strengthening my trust in your eternal promise that you, O oh love, will never stop loving me or anyone else in your whole creation. And yes, love, form me ever anew, mirroring your love, 
in my little life that matters to you. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you for that. And uh, so now uh, I have the pleasure to introduce you to someone that you uh, most certainly already know. Um, so I, when I was asking what kind of bio to give uh, for, uh, uh, for Reverend Dr. Cheryl, I was told Wonder Woman. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let me tell you that Cheryl is, uh, comes to us from Cleveland, Ohio. She attended the University of Pennsylvania and got a bachelor's in economics with a concentration in marketing. Uh, but because she's Wonder Woman, she decided to get an MDiv at Ashland Theological Seminary, which I think, and I don't have it, is where she also did her uh, doctoral work. Uh, no. So she's shaking her head. See, I didn't have that much because I was looking for it and I couldn't find it. So we'll have to have Cheryl share, share with us. But she right now is acting as the worship and theology minister for the national setting. And uh, to, tonight uh, she's going to share with us. Uh, Reflecting and refracting. Uh, so, Cheryl, if uh, your floor is yours, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, to be honest, I told Michael that I didn't want him to read my bio, which I, why I didn't send it to him. And I said, just make something up. And in fact, if you want to just make something up, you can do that. So, <laughs> technically, the the M the uh, the doctorate at Ashland was the made up part of that. I actually received a doctorate in worship studies from the Institute of Worship Studies in Jacksonville, Florida. Well, good evening, everyone. I do see so many wonderful, familiar faces and wonderful new faces, and I'm glad to be engaging with you tonight on this topic as we look at reflecting or reflecting, refracting the holy. Discovering Racism Embedded in Christian Worship, Theology, and Practice. When I started at Ashland, the very first course that every um, incoming master's student in the seminary had to take, which was Introduction to Theological Education, the first assignment we had to do was a reflection on our embedded theology. And embedded theology are those things that we believe about God that is so intrinsic to our core that we don't think about them, we don't question them, we don't even identify them unless prompted to do that work. And so it, it's something, it was an interesting assignment because it forces, it forced us to look at what we believe to name those things and name those things that are so true for us that we don't even think about them. They're, they're automatic. And then they inform all of our other theology that is more thoughtful and reflective. So embedded racism in our worship, theology and practice is what are, is discovering what are those things that we do, that we practice without thinking, without noticing the impact that they have. We're gonna look at some things that are probably also more overt, but that just enables us to sharpen our lens to see those things that we don't necessarily think about. I do like interaction. So a lot of this will be me saying, what do you think? or tell me about your experiences. I also like people to be comfortable in terms of participation. So if you have something you'd like to share, but you'd like to share it anonymously, you can directly uh, message me in the chat and I will not share your name, but I'll share what you would like to share. Or if you would really just like to share something directly with me, you can also do that and just say, this is for you only, and I'll be happy to receive that. But other than that, you can share in the chat, you can raise your hand and speak out in, um, the, uh, in our conversation as well, so we can benefit from one another in this. I'm going to begin to share uh, some slides with you that will be available after um, this session. So, 
there really aren't a lot of things in terms of notes. So I don't think you're gonna necessarily be taking notes directly from the slides, but you also don't have to fiercely try to write from quotes or um, do screenshots. They will be made available. Let's look at a passage of scripture from Genesis, a portion of the creation narrative that can help us inform our perspective. God created humanity in God's own image in the divine image God created them. And it continues male and female, God created them. Just think about that for a moment. What does that, what do you glean from those words from Genesis? This is in the first creation narrative, the, the narrative that goes over the seven days, the one that shows progression, the ones that shows God creating order out of chaos by separating, by making distinctions. God is male and female and more, thank you for that. So I feel like we have to see all of us to know what God looks like. Since all of us are created in the image of God, we can uh, collectively get the image of God by seeing every person. So what I'm hearing, thank you for that. So what I'm hearing from that, Ruth, is that each of us, uh, so that's a collective image. It's not individually, each of us bears the fullness of the image of God, but that together, we have the image of God imprinted on us. Is that, am I hearing you correctly? Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John C. Spirit, can you tell us a little bit more about that, John? I think within each of us, we have spirit. And it's, that's the thing that we all share. Our heart, whatever, what it is to be human, not just an image, a physical thing, mm -hmm. but the... Our thoughts, our our spirit, our loves, our hates, um, our touching other people. Um, that's where I come from, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So because I'm looking at Genesis, I also want us to look at Revelation, which we don't do, I think, enough in the church. There we go. So this passage from Revelation, I will read it because you might not be able to see it depending on your screen, is from a portion of Revelation 7, 9 through 12. And because we don't look at Revelation um, in general that much, I will say that Revelation often has these snippets of worship that is... Um, heaven and earth worshiping together. Um, so we see this is a portion of a larger passage of scripture that is showing part of a vision of this worship that is happening. And so um, John the Revelator says, after this, I looked and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the lamb. They wore white robes and held palm branches in their hands. They cried out with a loud voice, victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. All the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell face down before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. What do you see or hear in this passage of scripture as we think about this topic of reflecting or refracting? We don't see anything. 
That's okay too. <laughs> Cheryl, I, I, was, okay. uh, I just wanted to chime in uh, because yeah. I love this passage of scripture. Oh, look at these people chatting it up. Um, it's beautiful and it's core to who we are, but I don't feel like I go to a church where every tribe, nation, people, and language is in attendance, but I want to hear more about why that matters for reflecting God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Cheryl, I was going to say that the carrying uh, palm branches in hands, that's a very geographically specific thing. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate that. So what does that, what does that tell us or what does that suggest or what does that lead us to think of next or question next? Perhaps the, the writer of this or the, the one who carried the vision mm-hmm. um, brought the particularity of their context into their vision of what this heavenly earth intersectional moment would look like, that it would be, you know, it wouldn't happen over there. It's definitely gonna be here. And it'll have the particularities of of my condition, of what I'm familiar with, of what I view as heaven on earth, if you will. There are other details in this passage that stand out for any of us. What, I noticed what the word looking. I don't know if I'm on. Am I? Am I live or? You are live. Okay. Uh, it just strikes me that. They were wearing the white robes, and everything. But the act, the acclamation, is important to me. Immediately, the crowd burst into victory belongs to God. So, in the face of God and holiness, there's something in us that worship that wants to be expressed by more than saying, "Okay, Lord, get me, get me something." Mm-hmm. So it's it's much deeper. It, I when we stand maybe in the presence of God, if we live pretty good. Uh, I would hope that I would be able to say, uh, victory belongs to you, God. Um, may I say something? Thank you. Yes, please. <clears throat> In some circumstances, the white robes would have evil overtones. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> say more. Mm. Well, does the KKK wears white robes? Hmm. Interesting. So do confirmation students. Yeah. Yep, that's true. So the white, the white in this passage, I don't think is the problem. You're looking back for several thousand years, and uh, I don't think they're attaching, the author is not attaching a racial uh, element to it, although you could extrapolate it to do that. Why do you think the KKK wears white robes or started wearing white robes um it's related to white supremacy i suppose i I don't know the history of that what i think cheryl is that um sometimes our own context is what we read the text with and so Mm -hmm. so in one case we've got the what the white robe might mean for someone who's seen the KKK and associates it with it. But I'm also thinking like palm branches. When I was in Borneo, I was watching them Johnson and Johnson move orangutans from one Island to another and displacing people in order to make uh, palm oil. So Mm -hmm. sometimes there's, you know, the things that resonate Mm -hmm. with us from the text that we read that may not be in the text, but we take to it. We take it Mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thing that I get out of this thing is the call. The first call is to worship God out of this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, with loud voices, with thanksgiving, with um, with honor that to, to ascribe to God, we are creatures, we are second to this one. And we are be grateful to give honor to that one. 
in all that we do. Mm -hmm. And especially in worship. Mm -hmm. Joanne, were you looking to say something? Oh, at one point, you know, first I noticed that the huge crowd. Then the mm -hmm. second thing I noticed was the white robes and the palm branches. And the palm branches really made me think of Palm Sunday. Right. So I was thinking about white robes, baptism, and palm branches, and victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb as kind of um, that, that now victory is fully expressed in a way that didn't get to complete in, uh, in the same way at, at Palm Sunday and then Holy Week. Mm -hmm. So now victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne uh, resurrection has happened into the lamb, you know, but picking up palm branches again, which was that kind of first acclamation of Jesus. So that that's one of the things that made me think of. And then all the angels stood in a circle around the throne. So the fact that it's a circle around the throne rather than uh got up here and everybody in rows on their knees built, you know mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so uh those are some of the things i thought of when i looked at it sure, can i share something yes please rebecca yes what stands out to me and i've appreciated hearing other people too is the beginning where it says after this i looked and what i hear in that is a real intentionality to look and to see and to expand our vision to other people and other people in worship and what worship means in community um, and to see angels uh, and to see God. Um, and from there be led into new forms of worship together. Thank you, thank you. Well, there's a number of things from the chat. Would you mind if I read some of those? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so Marsha Peterson says the first line suggests all of humanity and seems to be culturally, culturally significant that the author is from a specific place and reflects that understanding. I think that was a reference to the palm branches, perhaps. Emily says there's a lot of mystery in this passage. It's mysterious. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then Marsha said again, the juxtaposition between victory and the land, which I also think is quite interesting. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, Truth School uh, says, I was just thinking that war, the war is over and we with our God has won. Hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so I chose, I chose this passage um, because of the first line, uh, but I want to give you more than the first line. And specifically that part of the first line, they were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. So I want you to think back in your biblical progression to Genesis, but, but a little bit later than the creation story. I want you to think to a story that again, we don't necessarily, it comes up in the lectionary, you know, one every, once every three years, the story of the Tower of Babel. And, and I'm gonna ask someone to tell me, would volunteer to give a, Cliff Note version of the story of the Tower of Babel. Don't worry about the, if you don't have all the details, we'll fill in any blanks, we'll correct any, because this is part of us unpacking the things that we believe, that we think, the biases, good or bad, that we bring to the text. So how, how do we remember the Tower of Babel. Is that uh, Deacon Yvonne Harris volunteering? Yes, it is. Dale, ha Harris Dale volunteering? Yes. Please do. Yes, okay. Um, I was thinking of that when I read the first line um, because that is the time that, that um, stands out to me the most about all, all of us coming together and the fact that it takes all of us coming together, I believe, to reflect God. Um, and um, I kind of <laughs> felt that that might be what I was seeing in this seg segment of uh, Revelation. The fact that 
ultimately, at the end, when God is reflected, it is it is um, only by <laughs> the vision of all of us as coming together as one. That's I, I believe that's his desire, his intention, and um, that's that's what I'm getting at. Okay, great. Thank you. It was battle was the time though when we all were speaking one, mm-hmm. and until we decided to build the stairway to heaven, <laughs> and um, think that we could climb it, and uh, then became um, a people that spoke languages and couldn't understand each other any longer. So the task is getting back to before that one. So in terms, thank you for, for sharing that. So, so yes, the, there was one language, one common language, right? Uniformity in language, at least. And then the people decided to build a tower to reach the heavens. Why were they trying to do that? Are they proud? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Say that again, please. Were, ooh, were they proud and and thought that they were better than everyone else? I think I missed part of what you said, but something about they're thinking they were better than anyone else. So they're trying to elevate themselves. Is that what yeah, I'm? Hearing? They were very proud. Proud, okay, expressing pride. Mike, you have your hand up? Thank you for that, yes. I believe they wanted to be remembered. Remembered. So it was a monument in a sense. Okay, okay. I think there's a sense of people have always been looking up rather than down, that's just kind of a, a natural thing to the high trees, to the mountains that attract us. Uh, and when you're a tall person, you attract attention in the crowd. At least I think that's part of it. So they're looking to, to draw attention to themselves, to stand out. Um, Ardeth? You're on mute. You're still muted. Wasn't it to be, wasn't it so they would be like gods? So they would be like God. That was their build the tower and re- that was, Yes, that was the express. And I think the other reasons that have been lifted are part of that, but their expressed intent was we'll build a tower so we will be elevated to be on the same level of God and therefore be more like gods ourselves. Not image bearers of God, but in order to assume that same role. And so God's looking at them and looking at their achievement. And I'm just summarizing a little bit because um, I love these kind of just we can go on all night, but we only have so much time. So God is, and if and if you're not speaking, um, if you can mute yourself because we are getting a little bit of background noises. So so God determines that these people with this uniform language will have no need for God because they'll be able to depend upon themselves. So in order to maintain the sort of dependency and this mutual relationship they have with God, God decides to disperse their languages. And some folks interpret that as a punishment from God. I tend to look at it more as an instrument of means. And I think God is more instrumental than um, punishing. That's my theology. Uh, So I think God has purposes and will adjust God's strategy in order to um, move us in God's purposes. And that's what that story is reflecting. What I bring that up, not just because here we see that there are still at the end in this revelation, in this vision of what it will be when, when recreation 
takes place, that there's still multiple languages. We look even at the day of Pentecost, which in many ways is a bookend to the Tower of Babel, where you have this dispersal of languages where, okay, we're introducing new languages. They won't be able to communicate in the same way. They won't understand each other. There's a barrier to communication. The diversity becomes a hindrance. But on the day of Pentecost, what happens? You have this display, the multiplicity of languages being shown and yet communication takes place and yet understanding takes place. Community formation takes place. Unity takes place. Without the need for uniformity, diversity remains. And even here at this point in Revelation, when we're looking at, okay, victory has happened. The final victory belongs to our God, but guess what? We're still gonna be diverse because it's not a curse. It's not a bad thing. It has become part of God's plan and vision for creation going forward when it is on earth as it is in heaven. So as we look at this contrast between reflecting and refracting, and this is a term borrowed from physics as we look at light and how light operates. And I'm not giving a physics lesson, but I'm using a metaphor. Reflecting is that is when the light is thrown back without being absorbed. So what you receive back is the same thing that was given. Reflecting is that mirror image. It's not distorted, it's not changed. It comes back in the way that it was given. Refracting on the other hand is when that light changes direction or is bent. In other words, it's distorted or it's altered in the process. And so as we think about this, going back to the Genesis piece as being created in the image of God, are we reflecting God? Are we, re are we seeing the reflection of God in diverse peoples? Or when we view those images, are we reviewing, are we viewing them from the perspective, perspective of a refracted image? And the images that we are also producing of the kingdom of God, of the diversity of God, of the expansiveness of God, are those images, whether they're graphic images, vis visible images, or figurative, are we doing in a way that reflects or refracts? Again, thinking back to from the beginning, God's plan for creation in God's image. So just quickly, just a few ways to make this metaphor um, more um, concrete or more to clarify it a little bit more in terms of what we're talking about in, in anti-racism work in the church. When we reflect the image of God, we're looking at the mirror versus the refraction is an alter image. So mirror, we look at people as they are without distorting, without adding to or absorbing part of their identity. We look at as they are. So judgment is neutral in reflection, it's negative in refraction as we look at racism embedded in the church. Reflecting, it's affirming of the value, the beauty, the belovedness of all creation. Refracting, it's alienating particular groups of people for their difference and distinctiveness. And reflection, in reflecting, it's an egalitarian perspective, it's a mutuality involved in the relationship. Refracting, there is supremacy and divisiveness. Someone is elevated over someone else. Some group is more worthy, more desiring, more something than another and divides. So the difference between, so mutuality is, uh, is sharing, 
entering into a relationship of sharing, whereas divisiveness is pitting differences against one another. Reflect is inclusive and expansive. Refract, rejects and segregates. Reflect is kingdom oriented, kingdom participatory, kingdom building. Reflect, refract is the based on and focuses and amplifies systems of human power. And we see colonialism as one example of that in practice. So let's take a moment to confront racism in the church. And from the lenses of worship, theology and practice and practice inclusive of our history and tradition. So let's spend a few moments um, and I'll invite us um, to do this in small groups. So I'll let um, whoever's working the small group thing to know that um, we'll want to be in groups probably for just about seven minutes where we will spend time and just identify, and this is not necessarily in your particular context. So I'm not asking for confessions of, well, my church did this and it's horrible. But in the church I'm talking about is the, the church universal. We'll get to our individual faith communities, but how do we see racism at play um, and action in the church, evident, demonstrated in the church, in either worship, in our theology, the way we think about God, in our practice, including it historically and traditionally, or in contemporary practice. Any questions about the assignment? And if someone from the, each group will report out, and um, I don't know, do we have enough information to? people in groups or do you need anything else for me to how do many that? uh how many do we want per group cheryl let's see how many participants we have 40 participants um let's plan for groups of eight which will be about well let's plan because um a couple of us can stay in the big room because there is a recording um so let's, but let's plan for groups of eight, which gives us five groups, which means you're not expected to talk for a long time, folks. Let's talk for a few seconds each. Um, in the group, I would invite you to allow people to participate as they feel comfortable, no pressure, no expectation, only invitation, invitation um, to share. Again, looking at the church universal um, for our conversation on this particular discussion point. So five group, I mean, eight groups of, of five groups of eight for about seven minutes. All right, here we go. Okay, thank you. All right. So. We should have a number of folks who are in the who are not in a group. So let me see here. Oh, and Emmanuel St. Bernard is they have a group already. They're in their own group. So all right. Let's see. Seven minutes. Yep. All right. All right. So, uh, Carol, uh, Marcia, Russ, and Nancy, Ruth, and Clark, you all are on. Uh, you're in this group. Uh, so this can be your group. And uh, we're just gonna. Uh, Reverend Dr. Cheryl and I will just sit and listen. I can listen too. Still he just told me you didn't get an assignment no okay so what's the yeah the question is
All right, Cheryl. So since we're in this group, maybe we can help out a little. Yeah, and I'm also going to just send it to everyone so that as a repeat. Um, we're, we're still seeing this, your screen. So you, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, because we're here. I'll okay. start to share. There we go. There we go. So the, the question is, where have you observed um, in the wider church? So not specific to your particular, I'm not looking for confession of your faith community, but where have you seen racism um, in the life of the church through worship, through theology, or through practice, which can include history, which can include um, traditions, um, or it can be contemporary? And it can be anywhere in the church. I mean, think of the universal church around the world and throughout time. Well, I'll start and say that um, Christianity as it has been practiced in this country and also in South America was a major supporter of slavery. And um, many of the churches uh, going back as far as the 1600s in Virginia, churches, pastors actually recommended certain kinds of punishment for slaves that ran away or were considered disobedient, which I have always found contradictory, <laughs> to say the least. So I have read, um, is it fact or fiction? that there are different versions of the Bible down south that were used during slavery times to impress upon the, the slave owners that it was their responsibility to take care of these folks because they were a lesser, lesser species, whatever. I think all I can add is uh, to those two points, <laughs> Uh, is uh, the, during this period of slavery, the, the city leaders that made the laws and operated the cities were also the church leaders. So it was the same cabal that just supported one another uh, in, in, this, in these uh, racist uh, views. On, um, geez, I don't know how to talk anymore. Uh, this is an ancestry show on um, what's our local NPR station, but it, it's on the TV. Yeah. Uh, that, um, which I find a fascinating show, but the, the priests that built Georgetown University, this was just done last night. Help me out here, Marsha, I see you shaking your head. I'm finding your roots with, Harry, uh, with uh, Henry Louis Gates. Yes, and, and that the slaves built the University of Georgetown. And this one particular person who was tracing their, their heritage uh, had three generations of, of, of the family that worked for the priests of, of uh, where is Georgetown located? I, I'm not sure. Washington, D.C. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and then they sold a uh, hundred and some of them to some, or, uh, uh, to go someplace else. It was just interesting that the priests were controlling all of the people. Oh, and they, Georgetown became into a financial situation, so they decided to sell off their slaves to make money for the university. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing, too, is that the tradition, what we consider traditional churches, has been based on only one culture's perspective of what tradition is. And so, therefore, we have not expanded many times as a church to be diverse and to include be, be as inclusive as the scriptures are that you put on the on the um, screen. And Jesus is all, so often portrayed. I mean, it's changing, but has always been portrayed as a white person. <coughs> I'm thinking about the fact that it was ministers who wrote to Martin Luther King when he was in jail and said, 
quit publishing, quit talking. <laughs> You're going the wrong way. <laughs> To Anne's point, it seems to me that many of the mainline churches adopt music and scripture and style that is basically from the European culture, not a diverse culture. And to that same thing, um, you know, I think we're talking about, uh, I think we should expand maybe our conversation to include all peoples of color, Native Americans and how the church is, what the church's role has been in um, keeping them in a certain position. Mm -hmm. Was it the church that went out to the Indians and tried to move the kids into a school away from home to indoctrinate them with the, uh, the proper way of thinking? Yeah, well, it gets back to Cheryl, what you were talking about with language because language <laughs> was denied to slaves. I mean, they couldn't retain their language. That was also true of Native Americans. And very recently in my own family, uh, I have um, now someone of, of Mexican and Yaqui Indian background. And he's told me about how many times people have said to him, oh, if I had known you were a Mexican, I wouldn't have hired you. And um, I said to him, next time somebody says you have an accent, just say, that means I speak two languages, which a lot of Americans don't do. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, language, that, that's a really important passage I thought that you had from Revelation because language is culture and, and the passing on of culture and history. We only got about 20 seconds left. Uh, I think of the doctrine of discovery. <laughs> hello everybody welcome back hopefully you had good conversations and um, just invite um, a few folks to share anything that came up that was particularly interesting in your conversations and we can just spend a few moments debriefing our small group conversations. And I'll just open it up for volunteers. I can go if we, for group four, we were, we had a lot of conversation. We talked about the um, churches feeling comfortable with their uh, segregation, um, that still some churches are showing a white Jesus. Um, how comfortable um, do we make others feel? How open do, what openness do we show? When, when new people are in churches or some of the issues. Um, the music in the churches is very European. It's what's classified as the good music and all other music is considered special music for that day or that you know activity. Um, not One of the benefits the white churches are doing is not acknowledging the racism. So they are not hitting the area or touching the subject at all. They tend to benefit. Um, we also talked about sometimes it's about the position of where churches are in town, that the white churches are typically in the center and where people can easily find them. And the best minority churches are not, are more hidden off side streets or what have you, and that becomes a part of it. Um, and we talked about if we don't, we're not acknowledging the racism because it's the quote unquote the water we're swimming in, mm. um, was, some, was one of the phrases that we use, and that we need to be more intentional. Um, that we um, have to be willing to conform and kind of get used to what we want to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cheryl, if I could go for group yes. one. 
I'd hate to be last speaker syndrome because some of the things that Joe was talking about, we were too. <laughs> you almost have had some real good conversation because we had, all right, towards the end, we were just really starting to talk about there needs to be a whole lot more work of preparation going on to get us to the point where we need, where we can be communicating and caring across these different urban, uh, suburban, or rural congregations. But some of the other things that were mentioned was how it's not just race. It has to do with gender as well. And so we have a deacon who gets looked askance at because as she said, women are not, not supposed to be deacons. Now, I know she doesn't believe that, but that's the thing. And, and we mentioned intersectionality is an issue here. It's not just racism. Um, and then we also talked about how the denominational support and, and one person talked about a, a calendar that they would get every so often um, and all the faces on it were white men that you would see from the 50s, okay. Uh, the rogues gallery of pastors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then I thought really interesting uh, where there is a outreach, a breakfast ministry, and there's a complete different comfort level people have engaging at the breakfast ministry as opposed to welcoming into worship. And, and the audience, uh, pardon me, the, the uh, people that you are inviting in are homeless. Mm -hmm. So that was group one. It was an interesting and, and lovely group. Great. I'll be glad to speak up on behalf of group three and I... Oh, you just went mute. I'm so sorry. I scribbled some notes that I threw in the chat. I think some common themes were that, uh, that throughout the history of the church and especially even to the current day that a lot of sources of information, whether it's what Jesus looks like in images or or what hymns are in the hymnal tend to be very much rigged in favor of the white European tradition. And when black resources are involved, like they're subsidiary, they're appropriated, that sort of thing. I also thought, uh, I apologize, I can't remember whom, but someone had a really salient point about the very disparate resources that a lot of white churches, predominantly white churches versus black churches have to work with, whether it's material wise or, or otherwise, and that in an ideal world, there would be more sharing of that and leveraging some of the different good elements from different worship styles, instead of having a system where there was no cross pollination and it was heavily kind of slanted, the table is slanted in favor of white churches. Thank you. There's some good conversations you all had. Two, um, John? I wasn't elected, but I'm gonna add something. Everything that's been said here, we talked about. The one thing that I talked about, it was the word uh, the dominion, have dominion over in creation story. We got that out of English and translation where the English were colonizing the world. Mm -hmm. And we've mistaken that word, which was should have been steward or partner with. And we have made that into our theology, which overcame everything else. We did not want to learn anything, anything, anything else in music, art, or the way we worship. Thank you. Some someone said in the group that I was eavesdropping on because they stayed in the main room. I believe that was said there that um, language is culture, and so I think that as we you know a couple of things have been lifted up about um, language, and we'll talk a little bit more about language from a very specific lens in a moment. But language really does reflect culture. And because so much of our faith traditions and understanding arise from particular culture that we are interpreting for our time, that there's not a direct translation 
from one language to another because cultures are different, so our languages are different. So even words that originate in Hebrew or in Greek from our Old and New Testament that we have translated into English, there's, there's interpretation involved in the process of translating because it's not word for word. And so you're translating not only the meaning of the word, but the understand, understanding of the word and the culture behind the words. And the interpretation choices that are made often are done in such a way that they reflect our culture more than the culture or our under as we read them, we read them with from our cultural lens rather than interpreting the culture of origin. I hope I'm making sense. So that when we're reading the Bible, it's more than just, oh, it's in English, so it's written to me. No, it's not written to us. It was written to a particular people, a particular time with a particular understanding of what was being conveyed. And we have to translate their culture to understand what the meaning that was conveyed to them was, because that's, that's the truth that then we should translate and understand for ourselves or wrestle with ourselves, more so in many cases than the details of of the stories, the narratives found in the text. I could probably do like a whole class just on that piece, but hopefully that was a little, that made a little bit of sense. Mike, yeah, raise your hand. So one of the things that Ben uh, put into the chat is that uh, a lot of the theologians were white. Uh, Willie James Jennings is a theologian who is absolutely fabulous, and his book on the Christian social imagination goes in with what Cheryl was just saying. Um, and this supersessionism, when the center of Christendom moved from Jerusalem to Europe, whether it was Rome or some other part of Europe, at that point, the whole European culture felt free to say the Bible is written to us, we own it. Uh, and this kind of uh, move continues to devil us. Somebody recently says, said, we need to remember we're guests in the house. That's all I got. Thank you, that's good stuff. I'm gonna start sharing my screen unless there's someone, some other, something else that came out of our small group workout sessions. Okay, um, go back. So <clears throat> I want you to think about this when we are, so we've done that process globally. Think about as we are going through the next few slides, think about these questions for your own faith community. So right now, this is a re the rhetorical question that I'm asking so that you can begin to reflect um, very specifically on your uh, context. How does your faith community reflect the holy and how does it reflect, refract the holy? And, and virtually all of our communities do both to some degree. Let's talk about exegeting the service. And when I talk about exegesis, for those of you who are not preachers, exegesis is, um, is a process of interpreting the text that you, you do before you prepare Bible study or before you prepare sermon. You go into the text and you do the work of unpacking it in a sense. We can exegete a, the things that we do. We can exegete the ways in which we are um, practicing our faith, the images that we have, and the ways in which we are conveying our faith publicly or even internally. So um, it was mentioned in one of the groups about the images of Jesus. These are, I did a search of Adobe images and just put in Jesus. And these were like the first three, I just picked the first three that came up. What do you notice?
Jesus is white. Yes, and bearded. So are all the people around him. And everyone around him. Mm-hmm. Now, Jesus, the incarnation occurs at a time where we don't have an image of Jesus. And so we don't, um, there, there, there's no, you know, archival evidence of what Jesus looked like. And if you notice in the biblical passages, he's not described physically in any of the gospels that are part of our canon. I can't say that I've looked at all the other gospels that didn't make it into our Bibles, but he's not physically described. And yet, even if I didn't say that, you know, these images were of Jesus, you probably would have recognized that these images are to portray Jesus because they're so similar to what we find commonly used. Now we saw in our our wonderful opening devotional, other images from other cultures that reflect, um, reflect the divine, the holy, in more diverse ways. And other cultures do the same thing. You can find images of Jesus as an Asian, a person of Asian descent or other, but we know that because we live in a culture that's not only dominating in our area of the world, but is dominating throughout the world, particularly in, as it relates to publishing and producing, um, mass producing, particularly in spreading the gospel in places it wasn't in, in, in the, the missionary sphere, they didn't produce images that were culturally specific for other cultures when they did doing that spreading of the gospel, right? So these images are found in homes on all continents because that's, that is the image of God that, um, that has been pervasively um, shared in society. That's an obvious example. I wanna show you another. Look at these there, I have four images here. What do you notice about them? These were based on two different searches. I'll I'll give you that hint. Does any noticing at all? You you have to really um, look for um, a person of African descent to be in pictures, and in the one in the the bottom um, right. There's none. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's just, um, and the only picture of um, a person of African descent w- is actually from Africa, probably, is that, and it's light and dark. So, all of that. Yeah, the light. I Boy. Heard the light, mm hmm. I seem to be looking in on the other group. I'm outside looking in. Uh, you, you might need to mute. Um, we're hearing, hearing a little bit of background conversation. <laughs> it's all staged. It's all staged. Well, it, it well, at least you know. To make sure these that are stock some... photos. These are stock photos because. Um, that's where I did the search. I didn't do a Google search because I wanted to. These are I have license for these images, so because I knew I'm the chairman, so I wanted to make sure I had license for them. So they they are, but I did particular searches. So I searched. You searched for children. I did. I but both searches were for children. One search was for happy children. 
The other search was for poor children. Well, of the children shown who are, you know, might be of African descent, they're most all but the one in the left hand corner are pretty light skinned. Mm -hmm. Which is traditionally more acceptable. So it, so we understand and understand when I talk about racism, I'm talking beyond racism that's targeted towards people of African descent. I'm talking about racism in all its forms and against all peoples. Um, and there are, um, and because race is a human construct, um, there are folks who are of African descent who look white and there are, you know, so we can't necessarily from our images always know but you probably can guess which image came up when I did the search for a poor child. Awful. And I say this particularly because in our churches, how often I see when I, because occasionally I'll just watch a random service on YouTube or that uh, from a church streaming, and they'll have images when they're doing their mission moment or something of that nature. And it's the only time you see um, a person of color a non-white person in any of their graphics or in the sanctuary as well. And the connotation is that people of color need our charity. And that is how we have them enter into our spaces. It could not possibly be as these other images. And yes, Colorism is a thing. So within racism, you also have to deal with colorism. And it's not that uh, people with lighter skin who may be of African descent, who may be Latinx, who may be of, of native or in indigenous origins, um, or who may be of Asian descent, um, don't count because they do. But we do know it's all, they're, they're more palatable their appearance can be more palatable to people who would like to pretend that they're not there. It's easier for them to blend in and not be seen. But I mean, we've had instances where we've had presenters and an association gathering who did a presentation. And when he talked about, it was a stewardship presentation. And when he talked about giving and mission, we put up the stereotypical picture of a poor child from Africa. We don't know actually where this child is from, but we assume that because that is the narrative that's been embedded in our consciousness. Is there anything inherently racist about that image on its own? No, but when you look at the complete context of it and how we choose the images that we use, then it can reflect a racist point of view. Does that make sense? Does that track? And so that's that's a visual, it's kind of it's easy to grasp. There are other ways in which we can exegete our service. Let's talk about language. Let's talk about my current biggest pet peeve because it is so pervasive in our society. There was a time when um, there, that we would talk about white and black as um, equivalent to good and evil. And there seemed to be a certain consciousness that, oh no, that's too explicit. But what happened then it became, well, it's light and dark as metaphors for good and evil. But when you're of dark skin, you don't need them to say black <laughs> to know what, you're what they're talking about. And the reality is it's so pervasive that people of color use the same language. So one of the things I would like to bring up is that just because a a people of color can be impacted by a system that oppresses them 
And because they're in that same, they're living in that same society and the same system, they can adopt either by sort of osmosis, it's in the atmosphere, it's part of the culture, or as a tool of survival, the norms of the oppressive society. What I'm sharing with you now is an excerpt from a sermon by Dr. Will Gaffney. Some of you may recognize that name. She recently published the woman's narrative, uh, the woman's lectionary, a lectionary for the whole church. Um, it is absolutely incredible body of work. But it is, uh, and I won't necessarily go into that, but she has done a lot of wo womanist writing. She is a um, Old Testament professor, and she talks a lot about the language that we use, the language we use for God, and just the way that language impacts our biblical and theological understanding. And here she is, has an uh, excerpt from a sermon that she delivered, and she it was during the season of Advent, and she was talking about darkness. So I will read through this, and then we can just um, discuss that briefly. In the velvet darkness, darker than a thousand midnights down in the cypress swamp, this luminous darkness, this radiant blackness, the holy black and holy black womb of God pulsed life into the world against a tapestry of holy, life-giving, darkly radiant blackness, shaping, molding, knitting, coalescing earth stuff from stardust, from God stuff, all before uttering the first word. Some of our fear, and she's continuing, there's a gap here in the sermon. Some of our fear of the dark is ancient and instinctual from a time when we were not sure the sun would return from setting or storm or eclipse. Stay with us, Lord of light, for the night is dark and full of terrors. The prayer to the red God of Game of Thrones is in many ways the perfect embodiment of this and perhaps a worthy Advent prayer, at least in the service where there's a light over at the Frankenstein house from the Rocky Horror Picture Show is the Advent hymn. But some of our fear of the dark is carefully calculated and mercenary. Some lost sight of or chose not to see the beauty of the diversity of creation, having lost the memory of their own ancestral African roots, and when encountering a suddenly much larger world, saw that our Black beauty was valuable, profitable, saleable. Then beginning in 1619 on this continent, those ancient fears were seized upon and weaponized to build this nation on a foundation of slavery and genocide, and the rhetoric of Blackness became all that was wrong in the world, just as Malik el Haj el Shabazz taught us when he was Malcolm X, Black ball, Black sheep, Black male, Black hearted, Black people. And that was from the sermon titled Holy Blackness, the Matrix of creation. And so she's talking about, she begins, and that the first piece from the first slide was in the beginning of um, the sermon where she is sort of retelling the creation narrative um, and, and expanding and amplifying sort of the beauty of the night, the beauty of darkness, the beauty of blackness. And then she goes on to get to this the ways in which um, it has been weaponized and become a metaphor equivalent of evil in the world. And, and, and in this piece, ending with um, these words from Malcolm X that explicitly, culturally make Black an evil um, or um, secondary or disfavorable thing. But the same thing is happening with darkness today. We talk about living in dark times. We talk about um, things being always oh, very dark to mean that it was what? What are some of the ways to think about, let's spend a little bit of time 
just thinking about what are words that instead of using those specific words, we just end up using dark to describe. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see you. It's hard to see with the screen up. In a negative way, the dark ages, ignorance. Mm -hmm. Evil. Evil. Mm -hmm. Sinister, depressing. Mm -hmm. I have a um, a recommendation to watch The Journey of Man, Dr. Michael Wood. So I'm just share that with the group. Dark Vader, the dark father, mm. right? He was not a good father. Reference to the occult, absolutely. Dark magic, gloomy, mm -hmm. sinister, evil hidden. And instead of using those more specific terms, end up in this way of just saying, oh, it was, it was just, it was dark. Yeah. But is dark actually descriptive of those things? Or have we just made it so? Because we've determined that all that is bad in the world can be summarized by calling it dark. Because when we do that, we say, well, there's nothing good that comes from the darkness. Yet we go back to that same creation nar narrative that tells us that God creates us in God's image. It also talks about God separating the light from the darkness. And they were both good. They're just different, distinct, diverse. One is not better or worse than the other, they're different. And the, and it, the difference serves us, the difference benefits us. And if you, um, I have a link in that, in the, that I'll share with you when the resource is shared to that full sermon from uh, Professor Gaffney, because it's, um, she really does a really great job with it. And it's an Advent sermon. So if you're looking for something for Advent, uh, <laughs> bonus points for that. So that's one example, but there are other ways in which our language, the way we talk about things, the way we talk about people, the way we frame mission projects, the way we, even calling it mission, even the way we, we um, the prayers that, that we pray. Th think about how we use the imagery of light and dark. And remember colorism being a thing. And it's not just in Christian circles, and it's not just in America. It, it colorism is a thing all over the world. Huh? So, as we think about, and I asked you to think about how your faith community reflects or refracts the holy. What are some other ways that we can exegete the service? And I'm just going to run through some some of the ways in which we can begin to examine on our own as and just being more attuned because the, the idea here is not to condemn us for what we've done in the past, but to make us more attuned so that we cannot cause harm in um, the future. And I see someone has linked the woman's uh, lectionary in, in the chat. Uh, so thank you for that, Ben. Um, think about what voices are being centered. So we talked a little bit about um, resources and scholarship and there are, scholars, um, there are scholars of every nation, every hue, every language. And so if you look at, if you're looking for them, you can find them. There are, um, there are commentaries that you can find and, and particularly when they are um, collections of, of um, different authors versus one author of, of complete commentary, you can often find diverse voices. And not just in terms of vo racial diversity, um, but um, national diversity, um, gender diversity, those things can be found. If you go beyond, if you are preaching and doing that type of work, um, undergirding by looking at journal articles, you can find di more diverse voices. And just recognizing who you are listening to, reading and saying who's missing from that. 
so that you're not just hearing from one perspective. Talk a little bit about appropriation. Um, so, the, so the other side of centering voices is how do we center those voices? How do we use them? How do we bring them into our worship in particular or Bible studies? Do we do it in a way that is honoring, that is um, valuing, or are we taking ownership and refracting what they've brought? So I'll give a brief example. Um, I've heard many times um, predominantly white congregations singing what are called Negro spirituals. And sometimes it can be well done. Most of the time, I will admit, um, I can't wait for it to be over. Not because I don't think, <laughs> not because of the musicality. The musicality often is excellent, right? It's often excellent. But they haven't exegeted the song. And so they're bringing in a song that was birthed by people on plantations, trying to survive, trying to send one another messages, trying to encourage one another, try, uh, born out of the quest for liberation. And it's just a little too peppy, to be honest. It's too cheerful, it's too happy. It, it has lost, it has lost the essence of what it is. And Sometimes it's like, well, if you want to bring it in, bring in someone who can do it authentically. It's a way to center. You can, you can pay someone to come in. You can pay someone to come in, a prof professional who does that work, or you can have something where you invite a church choir from another congregation you're in relationship with as a mutual relationship, not, oh, well, we need to, we need some black folks or we need some brown folks, so let's engage. But how can we, if we want to center that experience, we can't leave the part of the experience that makes it authentic to the original peoples from which it comes. So that's an example because Negro spirituals can often be joyful, but they tend not to be cheerful. And if the difference doesn't, resonate with you, I can have a side conversation uh, with you at another time about that or, or, or do some more recommendations. But as an example of, you don't wanna take the experience out of the context from which it originally was inspired and then make it your own to the point where you have stripped it of its original authentic characteristic and culture. So I'll put it just like that. So appropriation is, is one way. Um, and that also applies toward other music um, and other art forms, um, as well as um, liturgies. Buying into stereotypes, um, where, you know, there have been times where um, congregations have partnered across racial lines, which is a wonderful thing. But sometimes there's an assumption from one congregation that they're doing mission work when they're actually partnering with equals. And so, and that can come through. So if you're, part, if you're doing that partnership, do the preparation. Don't assume that everyone in your congregation, because that happens even in most, the most progressive congregations. And I can tell you that from experience do the preparation work of letting the folks know we're partnering with a congregation that is like us. They're different, but they're also like us. And so we're not going in there as missionaries, we're going in there as partnership. Leadership, if you do, are in um, multi-racial, multi-ethnic con congregations, how, how are leadership roles and how is leadership cultivated and recognized? How are different ways of leading um, recognized? that may come from cultural distinctiveness. And of course, recognizing intersectionality, which was brought up earlier as well, how 
the other isms, the other ways in which we allow our, our diversity and our fear of our diversity to fragment us, how that becomes compounded in the context of, of racism. The last thing, and I know I'm going a couple of minutes over time, but if you'll just give me a couple of minutes, the last thing I want to share with you is that as my role as Minister of Worship and Theology for United Church of Christ, I'm producing or curating resources that our congregations are using in worship. And one of the things I have done, and this, I didn't start this, this um, was done um, for one of our youth events, our national youth event, we created an inclusive language, anti-racist and just peace content policy. And that policy is something that all of, all of my contributors to worship ways or sermon seeds, all the writers that I engage for General Synod or for any other thing that I'm curating, um, they have to agree to this policy. I'll make this available for you as well um, as part, it's in the PowerPoint as well, the content of it, and you can feel free to share it as you are, um, if you have worship teams, if you have other people who are engaged in designing worship or doing anything that um, in terms of representing the church in any way. And, and the commitments of the church. So I'll just briefly um, summarize what's included. So we express our commitment as the United Church of Christ to be inclusive and expansive with our language with respect to both God and to people, the use of only masculine nouns or pronouns for God or generically for humanity, um, we discourage the exclusive use, rediscovery of gender neutral terms for God, um, as well as diverse um, gender imagery, um, complementary female, male, as well as various queer metaphors in the Bible that are found in the Bible, there, it's in there, um, help to um, expand our understanding of one another and reflect rather than refract. And recognize, we also recognize in this statement, our complicity as the church, um, small c, church universal, in institutionalizing racism in worship, where we only use liturgy and music of European descent, as we've talked about. Um, so we also encourage the fullness of expression from around the world. And so that when you are sharing music that you also, we encourage you to share where it's located historically so that people understand the circa, the era in which it was formed, including the, could be the year culturally, the language, the region of the world, as well as in addition to composers. Um, we also recognize our role as a tool of co colonization and cultural destruction. And we ask for our writers and our other content creators that, like musicians um, to avoid metaphors of empire and military conquest as a way to speak about God's love and the movement of the Holy Spirit on earth. We encourage expansive imagery faithful to the gospel and demonstrates life and life-giving relationships and helps us to imagine the kingdom, the reign of God on earth. Earth and the beloved community. And our content policy also, we acknowledge that inclusive language is a fundamental aspect of social justice that affirms sexuality, racial, ethnic background, stages of maturity, and degrees of limiting conditions, respect for all people, that it's found there in the scripture and that we want us to also recognize recognize the power that our words have to affirm, to liberate. And so we ask for all of our folks to consider those things. And that's another way of looking at how we are either reflecting, not only the image of God, but the image of humanity, the image of our siblings in the world, um, the siblings in our faith community and beyond our faith community. And contributing to a world in which 
we see our differences and celebrate them. So I pray that this has been a beneficial time. I thank you for giving me a couple of extra minutes and I just really thank you. And if you have any questions or want to reach out to me, Lindsay C, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-C at UCC.org. You can reach me or on social media, various platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Cheryl Lindsay. Thank you for the gift and the wisdom that you brought us. Thank you for the guidelines and the resources that you gave us and the challenging, uh, the list of challenges that we have to exegete, the, our, exegete our music and to exegete our sermons and exegete all, all of our materials. Um, I, as we close, um, what I'd like to do just to share with you quickly, uh, my, a couple of resources uh, for you to know about. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, our uh, resources for the anti-racism uh, network can be found on the Living Water Association's website. So that's, you can see up here at the top of your screen, livingwaterone.org. And you can just go to the resources tab and go down to anti-racism and you'll see our anti-racism library there. And, uh, and in that library, the first item that you'll see down there are the content and resources from tonight's gathering. And as you can also see the content from uh, our May gathering. And then, uh, and then also you can see this uh, about the, our honesty for o uh, Ohio education. So I'm actually gonna take you there real quick and just show you this. Um, I, I would encourage all of you, Re uh, Reverend uh, Dave Long Higgins in his absence wanted us to just to, point our fingers at this website so that you all can see it and take inf get some information about uh, several bills that are going on uh, right now and things that you can do in order to respond to them. So the website here is honestyforohioeducation.org. Um, and then the last resource I want to give you online is uh, the join the movement, ucc.org. And uh, this is our national office's uh, new campaign uh, to respond to justice and to bring us all together for this work. And uh, so uh, the join the movement toward racial justice and it's join the movement ucc.org. Um, and so the last thing that I'll share with you is just uh, to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. And our uh, we meet quarterly. So our next gathering will be uh, in November. And when we get that date and the details for that, we will send it out. If you are not currently on our email list and you did not get um, uh, an email telling you about our event tonight, um, then if you would put your email down in the chat, we will make sure to save that for you. And then we'll, you'll receive all of our content information um, and information about our, uh, our, our next gathering and all the other things that we're doing. So, um, and with that, I will invite you uh, in to join me in a moment of prayer, and we'll close. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Creator God, you have gifted us with so many good gifts. And sometimes we take those gifts and assume uh, privilege and priority rather than recognize the goodness and the bounty that you offer all of us. God, you've reminded us tonight that while there is one God and one source of life, that we're all a reflection of your divine image. So God, in the gifts and the wisdom that you have granted us, we pray that you will move us, that you will reshape us so that we can become the church of justice that you call us to be, your hands and feet in an anti-racist world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for joining us and go in peace. And God be with you till we meet again.